welcome uh, as we get started. It's nice to be doing our uh, the beginning of our second uh, uh, Kittrell Pitch Competition. Uh, I think this is just indicative of the progress that we are making in the entrepreneurship program at Lipscomb. Uh, this program has been going for about five years now, and we have been able to uh, continually grow it. We have more majors than we have ever had. We have a lot of our uh, freshman students that are interested in entrepreneurship as well. Uh, we have a great deal of faculty support, student support, and I think we are in just uh, a very good place. Uh, this uh, p uh, Kittrell Pitch Competition uh, is something that we had had a dream about from the time we began uh, thinking about uh, do, having an entrepreneurship program because we knew we needed some signature event to help, uh, to help really focus all of the students' attention. There's nothing like money to do that. And so we are glad to, uh, we're glad to be able to do it. As you know, this is the preliminary round, uh, one of two preliminary rounds. The one, this is the only one in the fall, and it leads directly into uh, the finals of the pitch competition in April. The great thing about this preliminary round compared to the one in the spring is there's actually real cash money on the line, and Jerry will talk a little bit more about that as well. What I'd like to do to kick us off is to ask uh, Rob Touchstone, uh, who is the Director of Missional Entrepreneurship here to uh, uh, begin with an invocation, and then I'll introduce a couple of folks as well. So, Rob? Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you so much for the night that uh, is in store. Thank you for these students and for their ideas, their visions, uh, and the, the things that you've given them to, uh, to co-create with you in your kingdom. Thank you for the uh, judges that are here to give some feedback and to, to help us. We're so grateful for their time and for their energies and their efforts. And God, we pray for all these ideas that you would come alongside them, that you would bless them, uh, whether they win officially or not tonight. We pray that you would take these ideas and multiply them uh, for your kingdom. Thank you for blessing us with food to eat tonight. We're grateful for every blessing you pour out so freely upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we continue with the program, uh, a group of folks that I want to thank particularly are you students who have, uh, who have uh, become courageous enough to present tonight. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it is a challenge in many of your lives to be able to get up in front of a group of folks. And I know even that fact is challenging to some of you. But then to be able to put your idea, the thing that you really like, and lay it out there in front of all of us to actually be judged by three people. That's a big deal, too. So I, I just want to uh, thank you for your courage and your willingness to participate. Uh, in my line of work, I am able to uh, come across a lot of really good people. But I have not come across anyone that is more generous and that loves students more than Marty Kittrell. Uh, Marty is a person who, uh, who, who loves, uh, who, who just surprises you with his generosity in a lot of different ways. I was in a meeting with him uh, just this week, and we were talking about uh, finance courses in the graduate program of business. And uh, Marty is a longtime CFO uh, of publicly traded companies. And so he just pulled out his bag and gave me a bear and bull cufflinks and just said, okay, if we're going to talk about finance. Why don't you, he knows I wear French cuff shirts a lot. He said, if we're going to talk about finance, here we've got bears and bulls here. We'll figure that out as we go. And so that, that's just the way Marty surprises you uh, a lot with his generosity. It was through him and his wife Jane's uh, generosity that we were able to establish the, uh, uh, the Kittrell Pitch Competition. He completely funds all that we're doing uh, both in the fall and the spring, uh, the prize money, the promotional money, all of those kinds of things. And he does that because of his great appreciation for students. Uh, and, uh, and, and he really enjoys being around you, and I just encourage you as you get an opportunity to meet Marty because you will be blessed by the, having met him and be, by being around him. And some of you, his network, uh, Luke, is just really pretty strong, and you just need to know that. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to ask Marty to come and say a couple of things as our judges get ready and finish eating and, and that kind of stuff, and then we'll go from there. Thanks, Joe. Thank you to the eight teams for pitching tonight. I always get very excited listening to teams pitch. 
I have to give special notice to Charles Frazier sitting up in the rafters. Uh, those of you who have had accounting may have had Charles at one point or another, but um, as I had mentioned to a couple of groups over the years, Charles and I had a very intense relationship over a two-year period back in the late 70s where I had Charles for eight classes, all A's. So, <laughs> sure that you heard the story about Marty's dad directly from him because uh, that is who uh, this award honors and uh, you can see uh, why it's important to Marty that we do so. Uh, Jerry Stubblefield is our entrepreneur in residence and my colleague as we try to teach entrepreneurship and also as we teach strategy uh, to our business majors here. It's because of Jerry's hard work and leadership that our entrepreneurship program has really grown. Uh, he spends a lot of time, uh, not just in the classroom and formal classes, but I hear his office is right near mine, and I hear him all the time talking to students, trying to get you to get your financial projections right and, and other things <laughs> like that. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to turn the program over to Jerry, and he'll kind of get things kicked off for us. Good luck. Thank you. Uh, you guys ready to present? Okay, well, we're not going to take too long with this. Uh, tonight, uh, the students are pitching for... $2,500 first prize, $1,500 second prize, and $1,000 third prize. That's a total of $5,000. Uh, in the spring, they'll be pitching for a total of $15,000. So folks will be pitching total for $20,000 this year. Okay. The other thing that uh, we're looking to do is that Rob Touchstone and I are working together to bring traditional entrepreneurship and the missional entrepreneurship together, okay? Rob's going to take a, a couple of minutes to explain to you about the missional entrepreneurship. Uh, and uh, Rob, you got that? Yeah, thank you, Jerry. Um, so in January, I came on board here at Lipscomb to help create a uh, center for business as mission as a way of saying how could we utilize business to make a difference um, to give back, to do good, to give back, and to reconcile broken things in the world. And so our business's mission focus is taking um, business and saying, let's do something good with that beyond just uh, helping a few people, but let's create solutions to poverty uh, by designing businesses that are going to give back and that are going to um, create jobs and create economy. And so our um, Center for Business as Mission that we're developing um, is doing things like teaching students in the classroom how to think about business as a means for advancing the kingdom of God for good. Um, we have students right now working on specific projects 
in a very poor part of Jamaica to come alongside some people um, who have a difficult time in life. One of them is a man who's in a wheelchair and he's not been able to walk for eight years. He was hit by a, a car, uh, he was riding a motorcycle, was hit by a car, has been paralyzed for eight years. He's 29 years old has no hope really in life. Uh, we have students who are coming alongside this man in Jamaica to help him to start a business from his wheelchair. Um, we flew some of those students over about a month ago to, uh, to help him to, to write a business plan um, and to help him to create a product out of broken glass and matches and green beans, believe it or not, uh, to, to create this beautiful piece of art. If you're interested, I can show you them uh, hanging in my office. Um, and so we're, we're using business in, as an example with this guy uh, to create a solution to his poverty-stricken situation. We're doing the same thing with another man uh, to help him to start a restaurant in Jamaica, in a very poor part of Jamaica. Um, and, and this is just the beginning. We hope to come alongside and partner with people who are in oppressed situations to use business as a means for good. We're also coming alongside nonprofits in Nashville to say, hey, maybe we need to move beyond the, the donor base and to create social enterprise um, so that you have something more sustainable than depending on donors to give to you each year. And so we're working with nonprofits. There are about 1,200 of those in Nashville. Uh, we're saying, what if we came alongside you and developed a social enterprise to... Um, move beyond just donor relations and to create um, another stream of revenue. Um, so lots of exciting things happening in our new Center for Business as Mission. And even tonight, you're going to hear some of the students whose, um, whose pitches are directly, uh, whose businesses are directly um, seeking to make a difference in giving back uh, to people who are oppressed. Thank you again for, for um, your courage to be here tonight, all of you that are pitching. Thanks to our judges for your time tonight and for what you're giving. Um, and I want to wish everybody the very best. I know it's going to be a great night. So again, thank you. Thanks, Rob. Um, two other things I want to introduce the judges, but before I do that, I want to tell you some other plans that we're having for 2016. Uh, last two weeks ago, I attended a, a collegiate entrepreneurship organization or national meeting uh, in Kansas City. And one of the things I did for about two days, I did not do anything other than sit through pitches. And these were elevator pitches, one and a half minutes. And so I took a lot of notes, uh, and, I, and then I got to thinking, I said, our students are as good as those, or most of them. There were some good ones. Uh, but I said, our students are good as those. So next year, uh, in collaboration with our collegiate entrepreneur organization, we're going to start elevator pitches here. So... A week or maybe a couple of weeks before Kittrell, uh, we will have some elevator pitches. And those, uh, the winners of those elevator pitches will then go to the Nationals. Okay, we're going to pay for those winners to go to the Nationals. And there will probably be a little bit of uh, monetary award there, but not like, uh, obviously, for the Kittrell. Okay. All right. Uh, the last thing I want to do is introduce the judges. And uh, i tell you, we have some great experience tonight with... Uh, with our judges, uh, I want to introduce Betsy Jones. Betsy is the founder of Countdown Group, and that firm commercializes intellectual property and provides advisory services to small and mid-sized businesses. One of the things that we, we, we like about these judges is that they have a lot of experience with pitches and entrepreneurship and judging pitches and entrepreneurship. Uh, Betsy has also served as the mentor at the Jumpstart Foundry. Uh, she's, she's been a judge for the $30,000 Jenny Lemon Pitch Competition. And she served uh, eight years as a judge of the Best in Business Competition. And she was last year's Kittrell judge as well, okay, in November. So really great experience. Scott Rouse is the entrepreneur in residence at the uh, Nashville Entrepreneur Center. He also mentors um, entrepreneurs. Uh, once you get started and you get your business model, he, and he mentors entrepreneurs to launch. He's created a launch program uh, through the Entrepreneur Center, and uh, there'll be a little surprise a little bit later about that. Um, he's also a now, renowned specialist in body language. So be careful of what you say and how you say it to Scott. Right? He was also a judge for last year's Kittrell competition. And David Becker, David has been through the trenches. 
David knows what it takes to start a business. I think, what, about 10 years ago, was it, David? 10 years ago, David and two other co-founders uh, founded a company called 4UMD. And uh, they provide portable wellness and diagnostic testing directly to primary care physicians. And they've grown from locally to now providing those services in the southeast. Okay? So when we're through with the, tonight's event, I would encourage you to talk with the judges uh, you know, after the event. And uh, so I believe we're about to, ready to get started. You guys ready? Okay. All right. Who's first? Number one. Uh, good evening, and thank you for your time. Uh, we appreciate everybody being here, and thank you, Mr. Cottrell, for allowing us to have this opportunity. Uh, my name is Trevor Gormley. I am the managing partner at Century Stone Capital Management, which is a long, short hedge fund uh, based out of Nashville. Um, and I'm a senior finance student here at Lipscomb University. And my name is Daniel Sturdivant. and I'm also a managing partner of Century Stone Capital. I'm in the MBA program with a concentration in finance. Trevor and I are also partners in Step Together LLC, which stands for Solving the Everyday Problem Together. Now I invite everybody to close your eyes, please. Imagine what you did this morning. Imagine how you felt when you woke up and you had tasks to do. It's very important to remember that everything throughout your daily life has you hustling and bustling. Now what is important is how do you remember what you think? How do you remember what you believe. Now, if you open your eyes back up, we look at the distractions in our daily life, such as TV, video games, social media, and news, that all sway our opinions in certain ways. And we want to make sure that social media is put in the right light. So the problem with social media specifically, CNN released a study recently, earlier this month actually, that says teens spend about nine hours a day on social media, tweens six hours a day, and millennials a few hours less than that. Now, the reason this is a problem, they're exposed to mind-numbing information over and over. This affects their critical thinking skills, leads to declining test scores, and just an overall decline in our society today. So the solution, we want you to think for yourself. We want you to take five minutes out of your day to use our mobile platform that enables you to look at questions that you may not have time to think about on a daily basis. And what's important to remember is that when you are able to get up and be incentivized to do something, that's the most important thing that you can get out of something. So the idea is that you would have five minutes in the morning or during the evening to think about a specific topic that our program would prompt to you. And you would have the ability to post your results or your reflection after you view the question to a public forum or keep it private. There will be a diverse range of topics from Syrian refugees issues to the deflate gate with Tom Brady and how you view those things that are happening on a daily basis. And the ability to share opinion, opinions with other people so that they can see what you think. So quickly about our competition. Obviously Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you can see that they have a lot of, over a billion users for Facebook, hundreds of millions for Twitter and Instagram, and then there's also a Think Canada platform that does something completely different than us. So help separate from these, these competitors. There's going to be a leveling system where you can work your way up to like philosopher level. Um, there's going to be rewards that are offered, a feeling of self-growth, which you don't get from just browsing other social media sites. You have the ability, as Trevor said, to post privately or to a public forum, and you can, you can be a part of shaping a new generation into thinking a new way. Our target market are the heaviest social media users, which are teens, tweens, and millennials, as I mentioned before. And our revenue streams, internet-based applications are heavily reliant on advertisements. You can direct, direct to advertiser advertisements. Google AdSense will pair you with the best ads that fit your platform. We're also going to offer a what you think platform where you can offer opinions on specific brands that wish to have their names mentioned. We're going to be a 501c3 organization, so we will accept tax-free donations. And being socially responsible as a hedge fund, we want to donate portions of our proceeds to help fund this cause. So some of our expenses, uh, we want this platform to be great in user interface. We could care about nothing, le or nothing more than the user interface and how the person feels when they get into this application. So all the expenses listed here, the mobile platform is obviously one of the biggest. As I mentioned before, the different types of revenue streams, this is kind of a compil compilation of our projections, year one, $134,000, roughly doubling each year after that. And as you can see in the yellow, the 
amount of views which are much more conservative views per day than Facebook and the other social media platforms get. So uh, looking at Oh boy, this thing's so looking at expenses about $129,000 in the first year, and looking at a revenue of around $134,000, the retained earnings of about $5,000 uh, for the first year. Um, and, and I guess the real question is when you get down to the bottom of it, when you see something that, you, that benefits you for the better, we really want to push people to think this how can you change how you think, but not what you think? So now my question to you, judges. Boy, this thing is super jumpy. Is what do you think? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I am curious how you're going to get people to reflect without bias if they're getting all of that garbage in. Yeah, so that's the difficult part. And the, the steps that we're doing to... Um, really combat that is that we're not trying to throw everybody in a loop and we we don't want people to stray away from the news We want people to really reflect and see what I'm hearing from the news Is that something that I truly believe in? can I turn the media off for two to five minutes a day and really reflect for myself an opinion and build an opinion That's just my my own and so though you may hear these things and then though they may create biases I feel and a lot of people that we've talked to feel the way that you can say all you want, but can you, can you construct a valid argument to defend your point? And that's the biggest gist of what we're trying to get to, is being able to construct an argument that would be logical and uh, you know, factual for the most part. And we would provide facts on our, on our program uh, and the platform that would allow us to show people the facts rather than opinions. So with the question, there would be facts about what happens with the situation, um, and, and you basically are free to, to reflect on your own. It's not necessarily changing people's views. It's just allowing them to remember that, that just because you sit in the living room and, and think back and forth for 30 seconds about what the media is telling you, that's not, that's not what we're trying to strive for. We're trying to strive for people taking the time to think about what they really believe and not necessarily changing their view from the biased crap that you hear on media. For in, in your financials, is, uh, it's, it takes a fair amount of research to arrive at, quote, the facts. I'm, yeah. I'm curious where that's coming from. Yeah, yeah, so, so that's what goes into the salary slide. Um, there's, we, we've, yep. we, the specific salaries are allocated only to people who would be working on the questions and system, systemizing everything to have those facts uh, presented. So um, we, we have about two or three people right now who are more than willing to, uh, to, to facilitate that, one who is a journal, or journalism major from Lipscomb um, who, who is extremely excited to, to be a part of that and, and really research the facts um, for the questions that we would be presenting. Well, we are a nonprofit, so we are we are targeting towards the millennials. So this is more of like um, a trend thing that we want to create. We want to allow people to really focus in on. When we talk about, so, we, so we, you got to get more specific than that. You get, tell me who, what is your, let's pick a girl. What does the girl look like if, in, your, in your demographic? Uh, so the, the demographic girl would be the, the college student who sits on Facebook for six to ten hours a day and thinks that that is the, her only source of news income. Well, it's, it, it's not necessarily overcrowded. It's the, the mind-numbing fact that people, when they scroll through a Facebook feed, you're seeing what other people are doing. You're not thinking about issues that are happening around you. It's more of like, oh, Tommy went to you know, the pool today. Oh, cool, next. And so we want to integrate something that allows the social media platform to be looked at as more of, of a tool that we can use. On the financial side? Okay, so revenue streams, for instance. Um, we want to create a dynamic, create a dynamic that allows companies to come to us, and after you say your, uh, your, your reflection for the day, we are going to approach companies. So is it an app, or what are we, what are we doing? Yeah, it's an, it's an application. So is it on, the, is on, is on, the, on your on phone? your phone, yes. Where did you get the numbers for, to go back to the revenue stream? Uh, I think it was like 100 views, 100,000 views. Yeah, Google posts that information as as far as how many how many views it takes to make a hundred thousand dollars a year. So that's straight from 
the Google AdSense, their service, they, they quote that number to you. So would yours be at the same level that Google is in terms of uh, garnering revenue from, from your ads versus theirs? No, they, no, no. They, 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 they offer the they service. They bring you the ads. It's a service through Google. So, yeah. How are you going to... How are you going to uh, well, we're, we're currently doing a beta test market, so what we're going to be doing over the next three months is allowing uh, the people who are working on YouThink to be able to build these questions and send out a text message on a daily basis rather than um, pushing it towards the mobile app at first because we don't have the mobile app currently. Um, so we really want to start getting people in the mindset to, hey, you're going to get this prompted who's question. Who's going to build the app? Uh, we, we, that's, that's what we've had fun, and we're still sourcing through individuals to be able to do that. Around fifty grand. Who's doing something like this? Then? What do you mean? Who's doing? Who, who is your? Who's your competition? Uh, so you think Canada is basically the real competition that we have, but they're a completely different business model. Um, so they're they're so they're, so they're the same name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So are we gonna have a trademark problem with that? Um, they don't have a trademark. No. Well, so I, have you talked to an attorney about that yet? I've not. No. Okay. You can just be using it. You can, you can just be using the name, you know, something capital. And then somebody says, dude, I'm using it. You didn't, call, you didn't trademark it. You don't need to because you're showing you're using it. Okay. I mean, you're showing your, and you'll fight for it with an attorney to, to make sure it's your trademark. So you don't have to have a trademark for, it to, for them to be able okay. to take that away from you. You know, so check mm -hmm. into that. That's real important. Okay. You listed some fairly large populations of people you're targeting, and I think it'd be great if all those people could develop better critical thinking skills. We all want that, right? But how are you going to reach them? How are you going to self, I, I mean, are people going to self-identify? Yes, I'm that person who wants better critical thinking skills, or I'm actually interested in this. All right, if you've looked at Facebook recently, but it thinks I'm interested in movie stars and you know, country singers and whatever, and th there's very little news, so if that's my only mm -hmm. source of news, I'm, I have bigger problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when, one that, of the... And what, you have a $10,000 marketing budget, that's less than 1000 bucks a month. Well, the far. integration of what we've had so far, we've spent no money on marketing, and we haven't actually implemented anything, and we have 500 likes on Facebook that we haven't even touched the website yet, um, as far as like our page on Facebook. So these people are looking up on Facebook trending about self-provoking thought, thinking for yourself. Those types of terms are actually being frequently searched on Facebook. So we, are, we, we plan to use Facebook as a very big marketing tool to be able to reach people and individuals who are looking for that type of uh, installment. Thank you, guys. Go ahead and get started. My name is Alex Maldonado. I'm, the, I'm a PMBA student. Two more classes and celebration begins. <laughs> so I'm the founder of uh, Performance uh, Advantage. Actually tomorrow, I'm meeting with two lawyers and it's, become, it's gonna become Claris Health. Legal reasons, so we're excited about that. So what I wanna do, talk to you guys about quickly is is show you an application that we have developed and we're really ex excited about this application. So imagine you're an OR director or an ED director, emergency director, right? And you have to go up to your boss and say, how are you performing right now? Most healthcare system right now do an Excel sheet, something like this. Say, here's how I'm doing, boss. Here's my performance, right? Okay, now you have a VP or CEO, CFO, that takes that, compiles that into something like this. This is based on operation, financial, clinical outcomes. They look at all the, the, the facts and say, okay, here's how we're performing. Then you have another person, by the way, you can't forget, you're in a hospital system, so you've got physicians, clinicians, right? They have their own spreadsheet as well. Okay, so they say, this is how we're doing performing. By the way, have you noticed the reds? By the way, these are actual performance from a hospital system. 
Then you have that compiled when you call this a business core card. This is how the operation is doing. This is all the things, the little things that matter in the whole process system. How are we, okay? Then after that, guess what? We report to corporate. They compile that and they said, based on all the things you have given us, this is how you're doing, okay? They compile all this stuff and they're saying, this is our performance overall. How long do you think that took? How many hands did that touch? How many man hours did it take? Do you think they really understand the whys and the what? Who's gonna fix it? When are they gonna fix it? How are they gonna fix it, right? The clever ones know how to do it. These are the struggles in healthcare every day that we have. So Claris Health with Develop is gonna help you take that. All that waste, by the way, all the trees are killing, Claris Health is making a mechanism, a tool, an application, just a tool that will help eliminate all that, what you just saw. Claris Health, <clears throat> here's the problem we're trying to solve. First thing is the operational, clinical, financial impact. People really don't understand the impact all that waste just had. The other thing we're trying to do is the fragmented view of operation, the lack of connection of putting all the pieces together. We just read something that uh, Baker Health just put together, it's a healthcare magazine, that it did 247 hospitals in California. And out of those, they said, find out that there was $10 billion of opportunity just on five key things. I took two of those key things. One of them was the operational, operation inefficiency. They just don't do things right. When you see things like that, that's just the beginning of a report. There's many layers behind that that is hiding. It's waste. The other thing they mentioned was the lack of systems talking to each other. They run on different platform, you have no clue what they're saying. They're not talking to each other, okay? Claris wants to change that. How are we gonna do that? Here's our solution. We are, we're really not a software company, but we have to use data. First we're gonna start with is app. App, why app? Because this is an easy way to get in. People wanna see this in, right, in real time. I have patients to take care of. I don't have time to go into a computer and look at the system. Why can't I get it now? Okay, information. So the other thing is service. Service, uh, service as well, which is the consultant side of it. The other part I want to do is, this is a platform. So many com companies are doing this somehow, somewhere. Parts of it, one, two, or three parts of it, but nobody out there in the market is doing it all combined in one, okay? Nobody's doing so that's what we want to bring to the platform. The three things I want to make sure highlight, we're gonna bring real, real time financial impact. Based on the <coughs> decisions that you make, these are the things that are based on the metrics that you don't meet, this is the financial impact that's gonna have, that's gonna take place. Strategy uh, integration system, and then sustainment uh, mechanism. Often consultants leave you, I used to be a consultant for six years. We're gone, see you, thank you, bye. I'm left alone with no mechanism behind. Claris is going, we're gonna leave a platform behind you. We're gonna charge you a monthly fee. Very in price comparison to what we're talking about. Revenue stream, make money, consultant fees, app, app like I mentioned. Here's who we're targeting. We're talking about outpatient, small, mid beds. The big gigantic like HCA, you got the tenants, you got the ascensions. We don't want to mess with those guys because they have, such, they have their own system now. We want to take care of the little guys because we want to tell them, you can be like the big guys. We want to give you a platform on that. What does that mean? Questions? <laughs> Sorry. Dude, this five minutes is so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So tell, tell me about your business model then. How, how's, how are you going to make? How does it make money? We make money by a consultant. We're going to have consultant fees, and we're also going to be on Who's we? setting up with How many Claris. How many so people? here How is the team. Hang on, hang on a second. How many people are in your company? Right now, there's four of us. Uh -huh. There's an MD, uh -huh. where there is a, which he also does informatics. We also have a pharmacy. We also have a coach, and then myself. And then two, next week, we're hoping to have two chief medical officers join the team so, as part time. Let's say if we're, if we're going to hire you as a consultant for this, then how much, what would the charge, how much would you charge? 
Well, it depends on, on what, what is it that you're looking for. If it's an app you're looking for, mm -hmm. that's going to be a different charge of things. Well, tell, a consultant talk, fee tell runs, some numbers. Tell a consultant fee runs anywhere from, eight, from $800 mm -hmm. a day to $3,500 a day. Okay. But it all depends on what you're looking for as well. What, what do you want to solve? What issues you want to solve? So with that, what, what, do you, what do you think is going to be, how's it going to look five years or let's say three years from now? Financially, what's, it, what's, your, what's, your, what's the income going to look like? What are the, what are the finances going to look like at that point? Are you going to have a million dollars? Are you going to have $10 million? If I give you a million dollars, am I going to get $10 million back or $5 million back? What is your hustle? Yeah, right now, this is where we are right now in the demo stage creation. Mm -hmm. And we just created the platform demo stage. And really what we're looking for is a client who really wants to try this out with us. And, and then, we, then we can have a caliber of, of uh, how much projection that would be Okay, what type of clients, what, what are the things we're looking at? Because that is going to set the platform, and also it's gonna, we're going to be able to standardize our, our, um, our software as well, but also standardize how we're going to package this. Would it be, what is it compared to, if, you know, if I'm a small business, because I, I like what you're saying over here with, with the actual club, yeah, yeah. hands, Excel, Excel. Yeah. Would it not be just cheaper as a small business to just build out its own database and create that? You can, but you look- cheaper than, you know, yeah. what you're proposing for an ongoing consulting fee? Well, what, what you, you can't do that, but the thing is that I'm asking questions, why haven't they done that? So most of the people, clients we're talking to, and, and we, we're, we're uh, in fact, we're talking to a consultant firm now that wants to partner with us. We're also talking to a small um, healthcare system that are also looking at building this thing together. And I said, we would like for you guys, because we want to partner for two to, we're looking at about three to five year well, who's, uh, partnership. Who's doing something like this then already? People who are doing this, the, the gorilla on the hill right now is um, uh, Health Catalyst. They're the huge gorilla on the hill right now. You probably heard of, uh, of Explorers, just was bought up by IBM last year. So what do you do better than, than those other ones though? We do all this stuff here, check marks. But we're also given the, the application is going to be free. The monthly fee and this, the, consultant firm, the consultant services is what we're going to make. So what is it they do better than you? Because I really can't tell what the heck is going on here. What is it they do better than you? Why are you, why are you better than, than, than the other ones? Why am I better than the other ones? Yeah. Well, one of the things is that the four things that we're doing, none of them are doing what, what we're trying to do. The four key things, which is the an analytics and metrics, the financial modeling, and the growth. Then None they, of them are doing that. Then what, then what are they doing? What do they do? All they're doing is software analytics and metrics. Like, if you look at Teletracker, mm -hmm. they've been there for 20 years. They just partnered with GE. All they're doing right now is building dashboards and telling you metrics. Take that. And all they're doing is, okay, now I need a monthly fee for all that stuff. They're not integrating the whole system, the four key platform, or the service side of it. How much are they compared to what you're going to be? Yeah, that was How much is what? How much are they going to be compared to what you're going to be? How much do they cost compared to yours? Their cost, <laughs> and it's all based on, they're looking for the big guys. So when you're, you're looking at their platform, if you would buy their platform, just the maintenance fees on there, it's about between 250 and 350. A, a thousand. A, that's a year. OK. Yeah. How, how but much? it's based on your wait, hospital wait, wait, size. 250,000, you're saying? Yes. A year, okay. Yeah. And so what do you think yours is going to make in a year on the, on the, on the, as you peak? What do you think you're going to do a year? You know, it's, right now, the first person is going to be for free. I think peak, I think we're looking at probably 60, 50% less than that because it's going to be an application. We're really going to build a platform. I'm going to have that. What we're looking for is you're going to have this device. This is only a tool, but what you're going to have is we're looking at partnering with you on the consultant side. That's where we're also looking at integrating those two together. What do you need to raise the money for? More developers? Yeah, we got to build, yes. We, we have the demo right now, and the demo is, is in the first stage. And that's kind of what I had also was just going to show you, but since the time. But um, we want to build a standard framework right now. So when we try it, we could say, give us this, 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 and then we can integrate. But how much, you, how much are you going to be making a year? Why do you think you're going to be making when everything's up and running and looking great? How, how much are you going to make in a year? What's your company going to make every year? What's your? You took a 250 hospital system right now, okay, two beds, right? And you do a consultant, regular consultant fee, and you said, I need you to improve these metrics for me. Let, for instance, ER, 
Let's take an ER. This or is actually hard data. Tell me how much you think it'd be. I don't need the explanation of what it is. What do you think yours would be in, at, the end of the, at the first year or in a good year? I'd say, they said a good year would be 350, 380. 380,000 yeah. a year for yeah. the, whole, the whole company. No, the whole, well, it, again, it depends on how many projects you have. I mean, well, I know at, that, but I'm saying, let's. But, that's just one project. If you have more projects, you just multiply it to how many projects you have. Okay. Good question, though. Do you have Last one? question, last question. Last question. Here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to clarify, you, you do plan to start charging for your platform at some point. Is it just in, just not yes. in beta? Okay, because yes. that's a scalable part yes. of your business. Yes. We are going to start charging. Here's the thing, this, this secret sauce to what we have. We build in a metric system that we have four things platform in phase one, two, and three. When we get to the second phase, that's when we're going to start charging. But we have to prove the concept first of the first platform, which I, is this. I, yeah, I understand how that, yeah. that part works. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the technology, is it, are you using APIs to overcome the interoperability issues? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right now, it's all coding. Is healthcare system has we think like HL7. You're probably aware of that. But HL7, everybody's like, everybody's like, does their own, everybody has their own secret recipe. Right. So we're, we're partner, actually, we're talking to Deloitte right now and next vision to help us, which is software here, and create, and we're talking about there, we're gonna build our platform. Okay. Is there any PHI that's going through this system at all? Or is it just clearly kind of HR, uh, internal employee stuff? This is, we're, we're gonna integrate the entire system. Health, I mean, you're talking about HR, equipment, we're talking about the entire thing eventually is gonna look at. Yeah. All right, so I'm Alex Berry. I'm the founder of Prep Pro Sports Management. I'm an MBA here at Lipscomb. There's a lot of high school athletes out there that could probably play collegiate sports but don't get the opportunity to because they don't get recruited. And why don't they get recruited? They don't get seen. There's also a lot of programs out there, Lipscomb being one of them, that could probably attract a lot better talent than it does, but doesn't because athletes aren't aware of the school. So the problem is lack of exposure and visibility. So how do we solve that? We create high quality videos. As you've seen, we've got some really good equipment that we can use, a drone, um, $2,000 camera. We do, we create highlight videos. Uh, these can be for high school athletes looking to get recruited. Um, if they're not being recruited, these can be for college programs looking to use a recruiting tool to reach more athletes. These can also be used for memoir videos for grandma that wants to remember her senior football player once he's gone to college. Another um, aspect to our business is we do, we, me and my business partner, we're Division I athletes, we consult these kids on how they can get recruited. Wow. 
So what makes us different? What is our competitive advantage? We have, like, like you saw, high quality equipment. We also create customized and personal videos. Um, we recently did a project with Lipscomb Men's Soccer, which I'll talk about, but we went down to Jacksonville, Florida, and we created a documentary for their trip for them. Um, like I said, we do side-by-side -side consulting. We have a high level of care. There are big companies that do this, but they're sitting in the nosebleeds, they're videoing your game, and they're sending out their tapes. That's all they do. We're actually working side-by-side -side with you. So our business model, um, obviously, uh, we make the sale, we produce the video, we help the kids get recruited, we have a lot of different packages for you know, how many games you want us to come to, um, what exactly you're looking for, if you're looking for more of a highlight tape or just a memory for your family and friends. Uh, we leverage a lot of customer relationships. One of the big things we try to do is when we sign a client, we try to get multiple clients in one client. So say we do Ensworth Soccer, we want to get three kids in that. It makes it cheaper for us, we can offer a cheaper price. Target market, uh, college programs, schools like Lipscomb, they have a lot of money. Um, high school programs, large audience, they reach a lot of people. But the big one is high school families, especially at schools like Ensworth, MBA, Brentwood Academy, Lipscomb, just down the road. Um, we want to create these videos for them, uh, either as memories for their kids or to help them get recruited to college. Uh, marketing and sales, one big thing that we do, I'm the head of sales and client relations. I, uh, I make a lot of connections with um, high school ADs. So, you know, I met with um, Ensworth AD, and then I go and meet with a soccer coach, and then I attend their parent meeting, and that's where I give my pitch to them. I reach a lot of people at once. Um, we're also attending tournaments and showcases. There's these soccer showcases where hundreds of teams are at all ages. Uh, we set up a booth. Uh, th we haven't done this yet, but this is in the future. We're going to set up a booth um, with all of our stuff. We're going to have employees there, lots of equipment, and if they want to sign us right there and say, hey, my son's playing three games this weekend. Get all of his stuff for X amount. We will. We'll put together a highlight video, a highlight tape of that. There is some competition. Um, coaches and parents do a lot of videos. They can't produce the kinds of the quality we can, honestly. Like I said earlier, there's a lot of big companies, but you know we provide what differentiates differentiates us is the, the level of care and the side by side consulting we're going to do with you. Uh, our team is me. Uh, I am the head of sales and client relations. I handle all the, um, you know, setting everything up for my production guy, Dan Coleman, who was a Lipscomb athlete in his day. He graduated last year. And we do have an investor and an advisor who's been in the sporting industry for decades. He's given us op an open line of credit, which is how we started our business. Uh, starting up, you know, we've got about $3,000 in investments we did uh, with the drone and the camera. We borrowed about $1,200 to kind of get it going. This is just a little example. So the video I showed was a Lipscomb women's soccer game. We charge $500 per game. I give 150 bucks to my camera guy, 150 bucks to me, 200 stays in the business. We keep a lot of the money in the business. We don't have many expenses. We've pretty much all of our expenses you can see there. All the equipment, we have the software on our computers, everything is set up. It's pretty much just a money making machine now. Um, revenue to date. So we did this video for Lipscomb women's soccer. Um, they actually signed us to their full, the full year next year, and they want us to do their spring games. So we're looking at a good chunk of money coming in there. We recently went to Jacksonville, Florida with the men's soccer team. All, all, expense, all expenses paid by them, and they also paid us on top of that. We've already broken even. We paid that back with one of our projects. Future revenue, I'm in talks with Ensworth Boys Soccer about doing a team highlight video. We're hoping to get some individual highlights out of that as well. Memoir videos are going to be huge. Um, where we're headed, like I said, memoir videos, uh, whether it be football, cheerleading, basketball, whatever. Parents and grandparents love seeing their kids. They love the, the quality of you know, seeing their kid close up in action. Um, they're going to they're gonna pay for those. Um, team highlights, like I said, showcases. I talked about that earlier. So where do I want to go? Um, I'd like to reach out to Belmont, Vanderbilt, TSU, Trevecca, kind of set up what I have with Lipscomb, get into their sports, uh, also the re uh, local high schools. It's my goal to get three boys soccer teams signed up. Right now I've got Ensworth, hopefully get a couple more, and I want to get into football um, come next fall. Uh, what I, if I won, I would hire another employee, get more equipment, travel budget for showcases, create a really good website. Thank you. This is my business partner, and that's me. We had this created. So where's the part about, about the uh, uh, consultant come, or the... The, uh, that part coming in. Yeah, five minutes only allows for so much. So consulting, so if a kid wants to get recruited, we'll put up a package, say we'll come to five home games. We'll create the individual highlight. Then once we create that, we'll take it to them and we'll sit down with them. There's a lot of little pieces 
that you wouldn't understand if you didn't play a collegiate sport of how to get recruited. For example, a kid might say, oh, I'm going to reach out to the head coach. Head coach doesn't have time. He doesn't care. Mm -hmm. You reach out, to, an, you reach out to, the, to the special teams coach or a GA. So just little tidbits like that that kids don't think about, but once you're there, you realize, and that's how you... So we sounds, give them these little tidbits. It sounds like you got two businesses going at once. Yeah, it is. You know? it start, we started with the, with the recruiting, and then we realized, oh, teams and memories. Like, so who's the CEO? I'm the CEO. I'm pretty much everything right now. Okay. What's your market size? You said there are it's a It's huge. Lot of, well, it's kind right. of big. Okay, so there's, right now we're just in Nashville, right? So there's how many Division One schools? There's Lipscomb, Vanderbilt, Belmont. Then there's also oh, TSU. There's no, Trevecca. How many people? How many people? Well, I mean, I don't know the exact number, but how many, how many fairly wealthy private schools are in the Nashville, Brentwood, Franklin area? Right. Those are really our targets because they have the disposable income to put down a couple thousand dollars for one of these videos. How many can you convert to sales? Um, well, right now I've only got one production guy, so that's an issue. But it's a good problem to have if we, if we sign so many. Well, I gotta, what, if, what if I say, hey, that sounds like a great idea to me. Let's, let's see me. You put in five, I'll put in five, and we'll do the same thing. We'll trounce them. You know, I got my, my nephews will do it. And, you know, oh, you're whatever. saying you want to be competition? Yeah, I mean, what, I've already got relationships what, everywhere. I mean, you could, but I've already got a relationship with Ensworth. Well, what keeps me from doing that? Even though you have relationships everywhere. Do you, I, don't, I don't know if you have the ability to create a high quality. Well, not, find, not that you don't, but. No, it, I'd, find a, I'd find somebody, the guy who did. Yeah, we'd hire yeah. Him. you could. It's, it's an easy thing to get into. Yeah. The thing that separates us is I've already got a lot of relationships that if you tried to go to Ensworth, they'd say. You make, how much money have you made so far? Um, What's your total? Lipscomb men's soccer paid us a thousand dollars to go to Jacksonville and do one game for them. So, so we charge five. Bucks. We charge five, and then we signed Lipscomb women's soccer to a full year. So how much is that? That's about six thousand dollars. Okay. No expenses. So what about the, all these relationships you're telling me about? Why haven't they jumped in? Because I'm setting up meetings right now. I'm, I'm meeting with Ensworth men's soccer team or boys soccer team in uh, January or February, whenever they have their parent meeting, and that's when I address all the parents at once, say, hey, if you want your kid to get recruited, if you want to create a highlight video, and we're also talking to the team about creating just a, a broad highlight video of their whole team, their whole season. Only home games, though. We don't, we don't travel right now. Is this financial statement a summary, or, or because you don't have any overhead, like taxes, insurance? Yeah, no, it's, it's, just, a, it's just a basic... I um, think you need to be setting aside money. Yeah. So, like I showed you in that one slide, though. So, really, our only expenses are me paying my camera guy, my crew, and myself. Um, we put 40% back into the business to handle things like that. Okay, so, well, that, that's not net, then. It's not, what, it's bottom not line? Net. No, no, no. You're not going to get to keep all of that. No, 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 okay. no. Does that change dramatically as you scale? So uh, a huge thing is, like I said, say we sign Ensworth Boys Soccer, right? If we can get four people, say we get four individuals signed up in Ensworth Boys Soccer, that makes it so much easier for us because our expenses don't go up at all. I'm still paying the same guy to attend the same games. But we've got four revenues coming in, four sources of revenue from one project. So, so it's 24000 bucks a year. Is that what you're saying? So it's what? So if you got 6000 bucks from a whole year of the soccer thing, well, that's got, from Lipscomb Women's Soccer. Yeah. If, so if you got three more and you had four all together, that's twenty-four. Yes. Grand. Yes. Are you going to be able to live on twenty-four grand a year and pay your guy and then pay the other guy? Well, it's it's right now it's a part-time thing for my guys because I mean, how much effort does this take? He, say he goes to a women's soccer oh. game at night. It's three hours, five hours of editing. That's eight hours. He's making. I factored this about twenty-five dollars an hour. Um, so, what, so what if you use you use the drone at these games? Yep. Or whatever? Mm -hmm. So what if the drone flips out and, and, and hits my son or my wife? Yeah. In the eye, then well, you're not <laughs> you, can, you have to be careful with it, but um, we've we've gotten it approved by all the projects we've oh, done so I'm far. I'm talking about insurance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's, that's something we don't have in place right now. It sounds yeah. like you have two different, like Scott was saying earlier, two different businesses. You have the production company, yeah. and then you have a recruiting company. Yeah. So going through, I've been through this process. The hardest part is not making making the production and the videos. There's yeah. tons of people out there. It's getting those videos and your face and that product in front of the right people. Right. That, I think, is going to be a lot more difficult than you think. Okay, so right now we're just, like I said, parent meetings. So I'm going to go to a parent meeting at Ensworth for the boys' soccer and say, hey, I can help you with if you want to get recruited or if you just want a memory, create highlight videos. 
that's, my, that's all my target audience right there. It's, it's really the parents. The kids can say this. They don't have the money to fork it up. So I'm seeing all the parents in front of me and doing it, getting it all at once um, with an example of, hey, two Division One programs. What, what happens if they all say, yeah, we'll do it? You can't do all of them. Right. No, can't I can't. I need to hire more people I, right now. I think I, on top of that, too. Actually, you, we can. You, you get, let's say you get the product. They all agree to it. And they say, I want my kid, Johnny, to go to University of Alabama. Yeah. Are you just going to send it in just like you would in the mail? Uh, you, no, you we, we give them the video. Alabama. It's We give them the video and the tools to get to get themselves there. It's their responsibility to get it. Once we help them, I can't just determine if your kid's going to play for Alabama, if he's not good enough. But I can give him what he needs to give him the best opportunity. That's what we're selling. Does that make sense? Yeah, I just think the biggest value prop you have is Knowing the, pe knowing the people in these departments, as in the AD and University of right. Alabama, that you can actually slide that video Yeah, to. so I do have some connections. Um, I'm using University of Alabama. Sure, sure. I do have some connections. Um, obviously, growing a database would be something we could get into the future. Um, and I think they, I know for sure they have companies out there. That yeah, they do. They're, they're, they're big. Like I said, they're big. They sit in the nosebleeds, and they're out. We're on the field, working side by side with you, making a personalized My name is Lillian Fisher, and I am the owner and founder of the Little Cottage Bakery. Imagine a little cottage house tucked away in a small wooden neighborhood. It sits next door to other little houses that can an antique shop or clothing boutique inside. Can you picture the white picket fence, the little garden, and the smell of something sweet wafting through the air? Well, this is my vision. This is my bakery. I would like to open a retail bakery and dessert cafe in a cottage-style house here in the Nashville or surrounding area. Throughout the last several years, I've been fortunate enough to work at several bakeries here in town, such as Gigi's Cupcakes, Publix Bakery, and East Nashville, which is a local breakfast bakery. Because of this, I've been able to hear firsthand from customers just some of their frustrations when it comes to buying sweets. I have found that people are very particular about the taste of cakes. They don't want to drive into town to get to a local bakery, and they don't want to spend a fortune. One of the biggest issues that I found is that many bakeries are specialty bakeries meaning that they focus on just one type of product, like just cupcakes or just cakes. So a customer can't get a variety of products unless they go to a grocery store. At the Little Cottage Bakery, we want to offer a wide variety of product with the intention of catering, catering towards people of all different income. We want to be more than a specialty bakery. We want to be in an open and convenient location where people feel comfortable enough to quickly stop in and grab something for dinner that night. And finally, we want to offer quality product that not only looks good, but tastes good as well. Because quality product is so important to my business, I did want to take a minute and show you a sampling of my work. These are some of the cupcakes, cookies, and other desserts that I've made. And these are some of the custom cakes that I've created. As you can see, I do everything from high-end uh, tiered cakes to simple small birthday cakes. I've been making custom cakes since I was 14 years old, and it's really one of my favorite things to do because it's really fulfilling to me to see someone celebrate their special day with something that I've created. Oops, there we go. This past semester, I focused on developing an actual menu. So this fall, I've been selling boxes of cookies, uh, pies, and sweet loaf breads in addition to the custom cakes and cupcakes. I do most of my promoting through the Little Cottage Bakery's Facebook page, as well as our website, which will officially launch at the end of this semester. On average, I have about one order per week, and they vary in size between small orders like one box of cookies to large orders of a variety of different products in addition to custom cake or cupcakes. The largest order that I've done was to cater an event for 350 people. Our target market will be based off two categories, the retail bakery and the dessert cafe. On the bakery side, we want to focus on moms and families as well as some professionals, while on the cafe side, we want to focus on young adults, both student and professional. Our goal is that both of these categories will play off the other in hopes that they'll expand our general audience as one business. This is a map that I generated pinpointing bakeries here in the Nashville and surrounding area. As you can see, downtown Nashville is really saturated with this type of industry. It's one of the main reasons why I don't want to locate my bakery in the downtown area, not only because of high competition, but also because of traffic congestion and parking. I haven't fully decided on an exact location that I want to be in. I've thought about the Berry Hill, Green Hills area, as well as even Nolansville. 
because I'm looking for a specific type of building, a lot's going to depend on what's available in the current real estate market. One of the uh, things to note here is that the bakeries shown here, many of them are specialty bakeries, and the very few that aren't have a restaurant attached to them. So as far as I know, there are no general bakeries serving just desserts in the Nashville or surrounding area. This is a timeline of what I'm looking at towards launching my business. Currently, I'm in phase one launch and foresee getting to phase three launch shortly after I graduate this May. If you notice, I've separated the retail bakery from the dessert cafe. Uh, this is best case scenario. That my first storefront would be the house that I envision. However, this will depend on the amount of capital I have as well as finding that perfect location, ideally in a lease type situation. Um, ultimately, I would like to have Growth One completed within the next two years or less. I am prepared to launch a retail bakery in an outlet type environment. In this case, I would hold a cafe until uh, I grow into the house. The last point in, in my timeline is to start an apprenticeship program, and this particular program has been a long time goal of mine. The Little Cottage Bakery is not just a dream, it's a passion, a calling in my future. Thank you. Do you know what levels of product you need to sell to generate enough income to reach these goals? Um, not quite yet. As far as like financial stuff, it's a part of the you know, Lipscomb undergraduate program. So when I take um, next semester's course, I'll have all that completed. I'm a fat guy, so I can say this. These are really good. Thank you. <laughs> Does it have to be a little cottage? I mean, can you, do, do you have to have a house to do that in? I mean, it's that's the goal. Uh, that's what I envision. Mm -hmm. I think it would go really well here in Nashville, kind of that type environment, um, kind of more of a laid back, not so much corporate like Starbucks would be. You know, I just see that. That's so you don't want to scale it up and make it, uh, do a whole bunch of these across the country? No, I want the most I want to have is, is two locations. I want it very small. Oh, why don't you want to blow it up? I've experienced franchise world uh, when I worked for Gigi's Cupcakes and I, I saw how it tore apart her family, the mm -hmm. owner's family, and just from an employee standpoint, it wasn't a good experience, and I took from that learning experience and I utilized it in my own personal view. Do you ever, do you ever try Christie's cookies? Get them a I've tried them, so yeah. Awesome. Yeah, they're awesome. They did this to me. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Christie's a friend of mine. He's a buddy oh, yeah. Mine. And may, maybe, and his, he's had a wonderful experience with it, so the, the members of his family. If, if I would jump with him, would you maybe just talk to him? Meet with I him? haven't talked with him or anything, but I'd definitely be open to. You know, some, so I'll connect you guys, and you can talk with him, with him and see what you, you know. Because yeah. his experience, would, I'm sure, just one experience, don't let that ruin it for you, because right. you can make a whole lot of money. Like, again, like I said, these are really good, mm -hmm. and that's just the one thing. So what if some big fat guy comes along and goes, hey, listen, I, I like this, and I want to make a bunch of these. Would you say no? I mean, to me, it's not so much the money part, and that sounds terrible. No, no. I want to be the type of owner that's very involved in the business. Um, I don't want to be the manager, but I do want to be an owner. And I feel like that I'm only capable of, a, you know, a maximum of two locations to be that type of owner. Okay. The only thing that makes me nervous, how many full-line bakeries you said that are independent and operating right now? There's, there's a lot of, of different kinds of bakeries, but like I said, a lot of them, most of them are specialty. So that would be my question is, is that a problem that you're feeling or filling, or is that something that the market's telling you that the margins aren't there for that to I've, I've definitely thought about that, and honestly, just talking from different people, I think it's just a, a place, a lack that I'm trying to fill. Uh, I think people are realizing they, they really want to do this local and fresh food, um, but to get a variety of different products, they have to go to the grocery store. There's no other option, unless they want to go to several different bakeries, you know. Have you interviewed bakery owners as well to find out why they don't offer more things? I have, and it's usually, they started out, um, like the East Nashville, I did an internship there, and so I really got to work with the owners there, and they started out with kolaches, and they've kind of grown into more of a breakfast place, kind of even started taco, breakfast tacos, um, but their, their thing is kolaches, and that's just what they've known. 
uh, the one of the co-owners, she does custom cakes um, and has taken like Wilton cake courses and stuff, and she loves it. But she just feels like that's not where her ability is, and that they just want to focus on the kolaches. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. All right, my company's called Fitness by Verse. Um, I'm a certified certified trainer through ISSA. I've done that for five years. Six years um, in the military, I trained, um, and then I trained at Olympian Training for a year. This is one of my clients in a 12-week transition. This is the the, whenever I started with her, and that's whenever um, the end of the three months. So you have the front, back, and then the, the side. Um, do y'all know of anything that can be done with exercise or the Bible, like together? Do y'all have any? Don't have any ideas? Okay. Well, I do, and it's uh, it's it's to um, put exercises with the verse of the Bible. So, for example, this one is uh, seeing the multitudes who went up on the mountain. And so you would do 25 mountain climbers. So you would think about uh, the verse as you're exercising. So to get you um, active, you know, spending time with Jesus daily as well as um, working out. And there's another example um, of Matthew 5, 1 um, for the, the last part of the verse. Um, the two major problems I see is straying from the Lord and then us giving up on ourselves physically, mentally, um, and as Americans, obviously, we like to kill two birds with one stone, like the easiest way that we can, you know, get everything done. So my solution is simple. Um, I decided to do a fitness Bible study, which is, like I said, exercise line by line with the, uh, with the verse. Um, it'll be your total body as well as your spiritual and your mental um, needs. Um, and I think now is a good time because I believe that this is my ministry. As corny as that sounds, I really do believe that. Um, and the only way that I know how to, um, you know, bring the word of the Lord around is through, um, uh, through uh, exercise. And this would be the first exercise ministry. There's no program like this. And I know there's a lot of people that say, there, say that, and there's not. There's Christian um, workout programs, but they don't go through the Bible. They don't go line by line. They may give you a daily scripture and, you know, write your workout that has nothing to do with that scripture. So you're not really thinking you know, or spending time with the Lord. Um, there's our um, obesity, which is pretty pretty high in all of our states, especially in the South. Um, the decline um, from 1994 to 2014 of Christianity, and um, both of my both of those would be um, targeted with my program. Um, so the key activities I would have would be studying the Bible, um, keeping up on the fitness trends, uh, you know, writing workouts every day, and it through different books as well. Um, for the physical Bible study, it's, um, you know, it has healthy recipes, you know, every day you have five verses to go through and that's what you um, will work out with. Um, the relationships you will gain is personal, spiritual, um, and, you know, with me through the website as well as you'll have a closed group to interact with other people that are going through the same workouts you are. Um, my cost structure um, for everything is, you know, publishing book supplies, um, the website. I have a business lawyer um, with, you know, working on patents and uh, trademarks. Um, my revenue would come from mostly probably from the apps and the website, um, but there's also ebooks if needed. Um, the way that I would get this out there is the word of mouth, going to speak to churches um, around campus. I have a um, country music singer that said that she would actually um, promote this on her sites and at her um, her um, concerts. And Christian radio, I think, would be awesome, like The Fish. I really believe that that would really get that out there as well. Um, so my target group is young adults, um, Christians, um, from beginning to, um, has, you know, long-time Christians. Um, 
Uh, so the thing that I would do to market, um, I think I got ahead of myself, but to market would be um, t-shirts, bracelets, social media, um, which um, this is, that's not really that important, but we are on, we are online, um, fitnessbyverse.com. I have a Facebook, uh, Pinterest, Instagram, and uh, a Twitter. Uh, but thank you for your consideration as fast as I talked and as nervous as I was. So, um, but this is, this is my idea of Fitness by Verse, of my exercise program. So, so how, how do the verses go in with the exercise? The each, each, is there a hookup of it or you just pick one at random and go, oh, I'm going to take I wrote the whole book of Matthew <clears throat> to an exercise, every and, line. So are they, so they don't actually, God didn't go, hey. I want to make this so it's exercisable if you, pay, you know what I'm saying? So it doesn't... No, it's not. Okay, okay. It's, so it, it's uh, what I think about and I believe other people will think about whenever they look at that verse and read that verse. Oh, okay, I got you, I got you. So for, this is just the uh, first verse for the Sermon on the Mount, which was the easiest one for me to show, which shows the proper form, how to do it. Um, and that will be on the website as well. Um, It'll have the proper form videos uh, if you like to look so, at videos. Wait, so you're gonna have. So how are you gonna make money doing this? What's the you gonna? It'll be like a. Um, uh, you can buy the book. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't. I've already started on other books like um, Crucifixion Stories by the uh, four different Gospels as well as John. Mm -hmm. So let just me go something. by. Let me okay. suggest something for you. There's a thing called membership sites. Are you familiar with those? Mm -hmm. That's that's what I was. Uh, okay, because that that's really powerful for something like what you're trying to do. Because you pay. Ten dollars, five dollars, thirty dollars a month, thirty-nine dollars a month, whatever. Twenty-seven. You want your number to end in seven because more people buy things in seven than in nine. I don't know why that is, but that's. Well, that's, like, that's good. I'll remember that. <laughs> so, um, that's what I would look into because you, you can have people every every month come and pay their extra their other thirty dollars. You don't lay everything out at once. You say we're going to start it in this year. We're going to go through month by month or whatever you're going to do. Right, and then on the uh, opening site, we'll have um, sign up for your free seven days, and then each day we would send you just a just that workout for that day just to kind of give you an idea of what it is to see if that's what you like. Yeah, and what you want to build is called a platform. A so platform. You, yeah, to do something like this, you need to build a platform. You need to learn about um, um, membership sites, get way into that, because that's, that's where you'll be able to do this and, and scale it up. So okay. you make, uh, so you have a whole lot of, of income, a whole lot of different customers. That's what I would suggest with it. Awesome, well thank you, I appreciate it. Is it just you right now? It's just me right now, yes sir. <clears throat> Like, what's a typical workout? Is it four or five verses? Um, it can. It Ten minutes? I mean, what's a typical workout? Well, the way that um, I have it set up is you can do it as a CrossFit workout. You can do it as, you know, just sets. You can go through it, like, three times. So say you want to do bench press, push-ups, jumping jacks. You can do that as fast as you can, like, for CrossFit, or you can just do it three sets of that, um, which I also have listed in my instructions on the on. Um, the website, or will be. Um, so it depends on how small the uh, Bible verse is. Like some of them, I can come up with six exercises and two verses. So I'm not going to give you like five verses that day because you're never going to get through six workouts. My, my, also, my goal is also to be time efficient. People don't want to, you know, waste time going to the gym. They don't have time or they don't have time to spend with the Lord. So this is my way of getting both of them integrated and so uh, I don't want to give them too much to work out. So I wouldn't give more than six exercises. So you're in the, Ar you're in the Army? I was no. in the Navy. The Navy, okay. What'd you do? Uh, I was a firefighter for a little while and then um, I deployed with the Army and did convoys. Okay. So, okay. so, so go ahead. Yeah, let's go ahead. what does your husband do? He's a welder. Okay. All right. Seeing this too, he's going, yeah, it's going to work. No. He's really supportive. He really is. I've been I've been working on it for a long time. He thought I was crazy whenever he, whenever I would be writing exercise for this while he was watching TV. So, All but right. he's pretty supportive. Yeah, Navy's fairly structured, so I'm sure you. Uh, so, but if you if you I hate to reiterate, do the membership site thing and build a platform. Yes, sir. That's that's really, that's key. You can do it if you do that. Sorry. Have you investigated deploying any part of this through Christian bookstores or other outlets that have? Uh, people already coming to look for Christian-oriented materials? I did. I actually um, looked at the Christian Publishing Outlet. It's a newer bookstore. It's in Murfreesboro. I don't know if you've heard of it, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's, it's a pretty cool store, and I've actually gone in there and talked to a couple of them um, as well, and um, I know someone at Lifeway that I had brought that to them as well. So um, I just, I don't know, um, maybe just the 
maybe if the ebook would go through there. I'm still working on exactly how I would lay that out it for that. Like you have a, a variety of information products, and I see a lot of copyrightable, copyrighted material that you've already produced. What patents are you working on? Um, well, uh, fitness by verse can be no one has it. It can be patented and trademarked. Um, so that's being worked on with the business lawyer that I have. Obviously, I would not use these for my site. Um, it would be me or my husband doing the exercises. Um, so just whenever you go on the website, you would click on the videos, and it would be me doing them, or photos of us doing them. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be from Google, if, if that's what. Um, you're referring to. Who, who's your lawyer? Who's your business lawyer? Jeff Carter. And what, where is he? Is he here? He's uh, actually barred here and in Florida. But can, he's, does he live here? Mm -mm, he lives in Florida. So what's, what kind of attorney is he? Uh, he's a patent and trademark. Oh, okay. Is it looking pretty expensive for you? It, it will be, yes. I mean, is he, is he charging like full-on expenses? No, he's, 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 actually, he's actually helped me out. He, he really believes in the product okay, as well, okay. so he's kind of, kind of helped me out with that. Okay. Okay. Great. Just checking. So. You thought about doing not only um, uh, you know video workouts, but doing it in person to kind of kick start it. I have I have thought about that. Um, I mean, I know that I would just be here in this area, and I would eventually want my website to go, you know, as far as it can. But um, yes, I have thought about that, and I actually work with uh, two groups twice a week for free, doing my program with them, and they really enjoy it. So. Um, for right now, that's just me practicing for, um, if this does get picked up, I would like to do that as well. Thank you all, I appreciate it. Two years ago, when I was told I may have a gluten intolerance, I promptly went to the store to check out my gluten-free baking options. Um, what I found disappointed me. There were flour blends that were like $17 a bag, incredibly overpriced, or other blends that frankly were really gross. Um, I wasn't satisfied with this and I knew other consumers couldn't be either. I also knew I could do better. I spent almost a year um, researching different gluten-free flours, mixing and matching until I came up with my own blend um, that works like wheat in different baking recipes um, and also tastes great. Um, and so Sweet Bites is a solution for so many people, um, providing gluten-free goods without the dreaded gluten-free taste. Um, I actually don't have a gluten intolerance, um, and so since I can still eat wheat, I was able to test all my gluten-free recipes alongside my conventional recipes, um, working and reworking and reworking until my gluten-free recipes were even better than my regular ones. Um, I also test all my recipes on normal people, um, people who don't care what gluten is, they don't care what gluten-free is, they just want something that tastes good. Um, and because of that, Sweet Bites is a gluten-free bakery that gluten eaters love to eat. Um, Sweet Bites is currently a B2C business, um, so I sell directly to customers through pop-up shops, uh, personal orders, and different markets around town. Our next step is to expand to a B2B model, um, wholesaling to different coffee shops, um, cafes, to build our customer base um, until we launch our own storefront. Sweet Bites has two target markets. The first are people who eat gluten-free diets, and the second are people who like to support eating locally. Um, nationally, both of these trends have staying power, and luckily Nashville has plenty of both. On Instagram, the tag Gluten Free Nashville has over 760 results. The tag Eat Nashville has over 6,000. Um, so it's clear that there's a market here in Nashville for both of these uh, targets. So as far as marketing goes, um, I plan on utilizing the Sweet Bites website, which is already <coughs> up and running, um, the Facebook and Instagram accounts as our primary channels, especially the Instagram account. Um, since I've become active on it in June, May, June, um, I've grown the followers from 36 to 240. Uh, proving what a great platform it is to connecting not only to customers, but like-minded businesses. Um, as far as other outlets go, um, I plan on reaching out to Nashville tastemakers and bloggers, um, like the Nashville Guide, who uh, gave us a little shout out last week, that was really nice of them. Um, publications like Native Nashville, Edible Nashville, and Local Table, as well as radio stations like Lightning 100 and 98.3. Um, as far as the gluten-free market, um, goes here in Nashville, there are six active shops, which is not too many considering there are a million people in the region. Um, what sets Sweet Bites apart is our unique flour blend um, and our rigorous recipe vetting process. Um, 
Most of my customers are not actually gluten-free, the same way that I'm not gluten-free. They choose Sweet Bites because they love the taste. Financially, I see um, growth and sustainable success for Sweet Bites in the near future. Um, I've been active on a part-time basis for June, July, October, and November of this year, and made $2,700 in sales in that time, and project to finish out the year $3,300 in sales. Um, of that, Sweet Bites is averaging about 60 to 70% margin, which is extremely competitive for this industry. What your investment would make possible um, is purchasing liability insurance um, to set up at different shops and stands around town, incorporating Sweet Bites as an LLC so I can begin wholesaling, um, securing the funds to apply to more markets and events, um, scaling productivity from my home facility to commercial kitchen space, um, and partnering with a professional marketing company to work on our branding. Um, please help me take this next step to success. Uh, thank you very much, and if you have any questions, go ahead. Yes. Is it your passion to actually make products? Because yeah. You, you, you've made a product, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, no, I, I do this that, all the time. That you could sell internationally if, if the flower blend? Is that um, I will probably later down the road, once I like finish having the retail space for Sweet Bites, I will probably sell the flower blend. And you realize that that could fund all of the Honestly, right now, um, like you can't like patent a flour blend. Um, but you can have a secret recipe. Yeah, like as a trade it. secret. Honestly, I'm just. I would love to talk to you about it. I'm just very protective of that process because it took me so long to come up with. Sure. And, and yeah. As I see it, that's your greatest asset right now. It definitely is. You also have the opportunity to do consulting. Yeah. Your yeah, business. I'm hoping to do that someday as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, a, a couple of folks here tonight have been cooking things, I think, at home. home yeah. Kitchens. Is that legal? Yes. Um, in 2012, um, Governor Haslam enacted the Cottage Food Act. Um, so I can sell directly to consumers as long as um, I have a disclaimer that says I'm working from a home facility. Um, but I can't sell to coffee shops. Um, and I can't even set up at most places, even if they invited me there. It all depends on the landlords and things like that. But one of the like, best things about Tennessee is it's super business friendly. Um, so I mean, I'm doing this legally and making money, and it's fine. Basically, the only thing I have to do is file my taxes, um, which I have never made enough money until this year that that's going to be a thing. Uh, but I want to scale up so that I can reach more customers. I think you're right about that. That'd be great. Take from Fat Guy again. These are awesome. It really is. Thank you so yeah. much. Which, you what did you try? Uh, snickerdoodles. The snickerdoodles. <laughs> so and yeah. if you didn't tell me it was gluten free, I'm the guy that wouldn't care. Really? Can you? Yeah. Yeah, I'll have one. So. Thank right, you so much. Good. Yeah. Um, I also, I, all my products are gluten free, but um, like those snickerdoodles are also vegan, so no animal products. Um, the donuts are grain free and dairy free. Um, so. For the people who do have dietary restrictions, I want to offer them a product that is excellent. And for people who don't care, I still want to offer them a product that's excellent. So is it just you? Is it, is it's just me. Team? Yeah. Um, so it's just me, but there are several different businesses around town who have expressed um, heavy interest in helping me with my launch. Um, I worked at um, Roast Inc., the coffee shop, for um, basically this whole past year. Um, and if I wanted to, I, and if I had like the LLC, I could start being their gluten-free baker tomorrow. Well, how, did you, how much money have you spent so far? Since I started doing it? Yeah. Um, including... I mean, everything, everything you've spent... Yeah, including like testing idea. and everything. Um, probably like, hmm, like three or $4,000 in the past couple of years. And how much have you made altogether? Yeah. Um, so it sort of depends on the season, mm -hmm. um, but I have always been like in the black. Like I've always made very like slim margins once I factor in like um, like utilities and how, everything how much like you that. At this point, how much have you made? Um, I would have to check for like the entire two-year period. I didn't really start tracking my finances until this year. So the sixty to seventy percent. That is on each product. That That's is the, the average. Yes, that is the hard cost. Um, and after factoring utilities in, it would go down to about 30 to 40 percent. Yeah. Um, I have been offered like free um, rental space from Eighth and Rose when they open their new warehouse, um, which is a very kind offer. Um, one of the stands that I have is at Track One Nashville, um, which is a small business and event um, venue 
on 4th Avenue South near downtown. Um, and I don't pay any rent there. The owner invited me. So that is one of the nice things. Right now, I really am making 60 to 70% margins because I'm not paying any of those utilities because I was invited. Um, so um, one of the things I like so much about the Nashville like entrepreneurial and food community is it's so collaborative. Even though there's so many of us trying to do the same thing, I feel like we all want to help each other out. So. What's required to have a kitchen certified as gluten-free? Yeah, so actually there are no certified gluten-free kitchens, um, not only in Nashville, but in the whole state. They're all dedicated gluten-free. Um, since gluten-free, like, as a label only was passed by the FDA last year, um, there hasn't been, like, a, like, nationwide certification process. Um, there are a couple organizations that are trying to push that, but they haven't, like, made it nationally yet. So the most that I can do is use gluten-free certified products um, and then have a gluten-free dedicated facility. What about packaging? Yeah, um, so that is one of the things that um, I will be working on with the um, marketing company. Um, I'm looking to work with Rare Assembly Co. Um, they do branding and marketing. Um, but like the logo and everything I do right now, obviously, like I've made myself. Um, so I haven't done too much on that front yet. How many products do you think you want to narrow it down to, or is it just made to order right now? Yeah, so it's made to order, but there are six different like product lines. So I do donuts cupcakes, um, cookies, bread, um, sweet bread, and like yeast bread. Um, let me see What's what else. Margin? The highest margin is 75%, um, and it's on the cookies. The cupcakes are about 60%, um, depending on the type of cupcake, obviously. The donuts are the lowest margin there at 55%. Um, I probably could charge more on the donuts, but honestly, I, I don't, I don't want to. The people who are actually getting grain-free, who want to eat a grain-free diet, already have to spend so much on other things that I don't, I don't feel right charging them so much on a, on a donut. Um, especially people who don't care about gluten-free, they're going to be like, why should I spend $4 on one donut? Um, there's another bakery in town. Um, they do paleo donuts, so gluten-free, dairy-free. They're charging $4.50 a donut. Um, I feel super uncomfortable charging that much for something that's gone in like two seconds. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, people buy them. They're, in, they're super good. They don't taste like, like they're like a dietary restriction, um, but they're also using some ingredients that cost a lot more than the ones I'm using. Yeah. Not trying to throw anyone under the bus. They're doing a great job. I just don't want to um, do that to my customers. All right, well, thank you so much for your time. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. And I just want to um, say that it really means a lot just to the support of Lipscomb University and all of you judges. Really jumpy. All right, and that's really blurry. I just want to tell you a little bit about myself starting off, why I'm in this industry and why I'm so passionate about what I do. When I was really young, I fell in love with massage therapy. Um, it was kind of weird because then a lot of kids don't say, oh, I want to grow up and be a massage therapist. But personally, my mother, she worked to raise three kids on her own. And at the end of the day, she'd have a simple request when she came home. It would be, hey, honey, can you take off my shoes? So I'd take off her shoes gladly, and then I'd just rub her feet. I saw how good it made her feel, and I wanted to make other people feel that way too. So the problem today and why Natalie's Office Spa is so important in our business world is this. Basically, every day you go to work, and there's so many different things you encounter that could stress you out, uh, make you less productive and unsatisfied at your job. And especially my generation, I have seen that most people think they'll stay maybe a year, two years, but it's not like in the past when people stay 5, 10, 20 years. And that right now, we're looking at talent, talent that comes into an industry and stays. So basically, we're looking for um, employees that see the quality of life and are willing to stay with the company as long as they're providing those services. Natalie's Office Spa is, provided, is providing massage therapy services to dedicated companies, to companies who are dedicated to the health and well-being of their employees. Sorry about that. OK. <laughs> Um, so it benefits both, both. Obviously, we know that if you have better employees, 
If they're happy, their customers are happy, the business is gonna profit um, because people are gonna keep coming back. But it's so much more than that. I've been studying um, retention rates and looking at um, what it really meant, what it means to have companies um, you know, have to do a new hire every time someone is burnt out or they turn to addiction or so many different possibilities. And so basically my business is going to companies and saying, okay, we're gonna be that difference. We're gonna say, they're not thanking me, Natalie, they're really thanking the organization, saying thank you for providing everyday service, their day, like the daily grind, um, and just giving back to them in that way. So these are three packet options. So I've been going to companies seeing what, in ways I can customize massage therapy services, whether I've come in and do a chair massage at their desk, whether they can come to my office that I currently have in Brentwood, Tennessee, uh, through a chiropractor. But primarily the main um, goal is to get companies who are expanding. Nashville is a great community for that, to get them to say, okay, we're gonna actually build a treatment center. Could be just an extra conference room, multi-purpose room, but have that so it's stable. The employees know that it's there, but um, it's something that it is already contracted in in the beginning and budgeted every year. So this is basically what it'll look like. This is a really old example from when I first saw this is my need. Um, for getting companies, maybe 40 employees, that's what I would contract to the company. But then I wanted to really expand because I realized that this is a bigger issue um, and companies are really in need of this service. And personally, I can't do this all my life and serving 250 plus employees on that regular basis. So I wanna have certain therapists per company going once a month offering those services, maybe come for a week, schedule it out. Um, and then I would obviously with a discount of scale, be cheaper rates, so. So my clients, this is my target market, um, I really want to focus on urban cities, or urban, sorry, um, because honestly, this is a place where I've seen, I've traveled, I used to live in LA, all my clients there, they were seeking massage therapy services, but they were paying over $100, and I want companies to start offering it. So basically, every company wants to be like Google, we, every year there's best companies to work for. Don't you want your company on that list? If you have a wellness program with massage, I can almost guarantee that you're gonna get on that list. This is my plan. I wanna really promote the website and a blog, networking, word of mouth, stress balls. This stuff is little things. I don't wanna spend too much on advertising. Market analysis, this, this industry is not going away. Massage therapy has been around, really growing in the past five years, but it's continuously growing as more people fall in love with massage therapy. I don't even want to talk about my competition. I worked for massage therapy in Beverly Hills and Green Hills, and although just two nights ago they, they had um, someone who was assaulted by a massage therapist, so companies um, really want to send their employees to places that are trusted, so I will thoroughly be um, making sure those policies will be in place to provide good quality therapeutic massage. Anyway, this is my team. This is the people that are really behind me and making this possible because it's not just me. Um, Jonathan, he's an amazing marketing guy from Lipscum. She works with me currently at Vanderbilt and she's an incredible woman. She's actually helped me with my business plan as well as all the financials that I can't do myself. Um, he's my web developer. He's a great, great guy and, um, and she's another therapist. Can't get to the breakdown, but um, this is where I'm looking forward to doing and um, I have a space that's a great opportunity just to um, open up right across from Lipscomb's campus and I'm really excited about it and that's why I'm so nervous. But um, yeah, I'm looking at this year being um, a big turning point. Thank you guys. Do you talk to businesses to get feedback about the idea of offering your services and how? Yes. So um, over the last couple of years since I've been at Lipscomb, I've really been pressed by our um, everyone here to really get out there. And so I've met with a couple different people, um, a friend of mine who works at HCA but is on the board of another company. It's actually a counseling service. They actually, he pitched it to the board and the CDO, CEO and they wanna offer it for not only their employees but their clients as well. And then another um, local bank here who is uh, really considering offering it part of their wellness plan. That's the people, the companies that already have wellness plans. It's really great to add massage therapy and they already know the value. Will they be entering at the prices that you showed us on one of the slides? You said that was an old slide. It's, yes, so those, that slide with that chart, basically it's customizable, but I just wanted to give an example that obviously the, the larger I grow, the more cities that I go to, um, and the bigger companies, like say they open another headquarters somewhere else, obviously they're, we're servicing more 
um, employ employees, so we want to give them a better rate. You mentioned economies of scale in there. Mm -hmm. there, there are uh, a few, maybe we can yeah. use some equipment and so forth, but it's very labor intensive. Yes. So how much does that figure into your financials? Yes, I'm sorry I didn't get to that, but that's the other driving factor. Being a personal massage therapist since 2011, I've been in so many spas where they underpay you, and like Massage Envy, they're the biggest one in this industry, but I want to pay my massage therapist more than, let's say, 20, 30%, which is what I was getting paid. And the best thing about it is that this is a network I'm creating companies getting into a plan where it becomes exclusive. And I want to offer, even as my spa grows, lounge, meeting spaces, and places where companies can hold events. So that's where those revenues are coming from. And I want to take care of my employees. I can't it'd be hypocritical to pitch it to take care of their employees if I'm not taking care of mine. Kind of touch on a little bit with the turnover. Is that something that's the norm in the industry? And how do you just by paying them more? I mean, is it is it just you and a therapist right now? Another therapist? So I have. Um, so she's actually on a license. She's a licensed therapist. I have several people I'm kind of incubating. They're in massage school right now, moving toward um, certification and the national certification, which is what I have. So I can go to any almost any state. Um, yes, I know that it's a turnover rate in this industry, but Massage Envy is a place where you turn and burn. You're gonna pay for an hour, which really is 50 minutes. You get five minutes before, five minutes after the therapist is really, it's quick. Other spas, you, therapists, I worked for the Omni Nashville. They paid me well over $50 an hour plus tips. And it wasn't just that. It's just I wanted to help people more. As a spa, if you wanna go there in luxury, yeah, great. I want it to be a treatment plan. I want to be budgeted in every year. That way, at the end of the year, they don't got to use up a budget and say, oh, well, let's have a big party because obviously, um, you know, just using up a budget, it's, it's not um, allocating the resources as well. Are they going to local businesses as well right now? Like Massage Envy or are Who, they just... Who's they? Massage Envy, are they going to local no, businesses? No, so that's something else I learned from Adagio, another spa I worked for, but they had um, some unethical practices. So I, I actually um, realized that... Um, I'm sorry I said that, that was not okay. Um, so Adagio contracts with um, different hotels and things. I don't know if this is okay to say either. I'm learning, but um, I'm gonna be contracting with other corporations. Right now there are to-go spas and places where they'll bring it in for like a holiday, but nothing that's on a sustainable, um, it's not budgeted out, it's not on a plan. So that's kind of where I wanna step in. Sorry if I'm pitching this. <laughs> I just the only thing that makes me if say you went into an HCA or somebody yes. that had two hundred fifty plus employees or, yes. or a lot more, and they said they have a massage therapist. They do, but their employees pay for it. And I talk to local employees that go to Lipscomb as well as some people on the board. They they don't just don't use it as much. Some do, some don't. I also will offer split costs because obviously some companies won't pay for it because it's not worth it in the bottom line. But if they can at least pay a discounted amount, all my uh, coworkers at Vanderbilt said they would definitely pay for a massage if it was just discounted and it would come to the office. Thank you guys for your time. Or did you have a question? I'm no, so I'm, sorry. I'm good. I'm good. I'm sorry. I don't know. Thank you. Well, hello. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Luke Benda, and I'm CEO, and we are Edpack Global. Edpack Global is a backpack company that for every product that is sold, a portion of our profits goes towards funding female education, both in developing countries and here in the United States. Poverty throughout the world has a woman's face. Of the 1.3 billion people living in poverty, 70% of them are women. According to UNICEF, education is one of the most distinct areas in which we see women suffering, but it's also an area that offers most empowerment for women. Women have proven to be the backbone of restoring communities and um, battling poverty. The holistic education of women will aid in the development of healthy families and the reduction of human trafficking and poverty and an increase in income potential. And that is where EdPack Global comes in. Um, we are a social enterprise backpack company whose mission is to empower women both locally and globally. We want to do this by investing in partner organizations, namely Thistle Farms located here in Nashville, Tennessee, and Mia Esperanza located in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, and we've already met with both of these organizations. All right, here at Ed, our goal is to reach out to 18 to 26 year olds, both male and female alike. More specifically, however, though, our goal is to reach out to college students. Currently in the U.S. there are 50.1 million college students, all of which are going to need a backpack at some point in their life, or in their college career. Um, at Ed, our goal is to provide them with a functional and fashionable product. Um, at Ed, we realize that creating a backpack isn't anything new. We're not reinventing the wheel. However, at Ed, whenever you purchase a 
backpack from us or a product from us because we're not exclusively backpacks, you're not only purchasing a product, but you're investing into the Ed family. Um, and that's how our products are unique. We create a large emotional appeal, which is a big thing currently for college students. College students today want to feel like they are making a social effort to change the world. And then by purchasing from Ed, they're able to do that. We do this through two ways. One of which is letters that will go out in all of our backpacks to our consumers. This will allow them to feel like they are part of the Ed family. Along with that, we also um, are putting patches on our backpacks. And so, like Macy said, with either an, a patch of Tennessee or a patch of Honduras, our consumers will feel like they are making a difference and they will know where their money is going towards and they will know where they're helping, which will make a huge impact on them individually. Our goal to pr promote our product is through social marketing. Um, currently, we are um, working on our Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, along with our website. Those are all in development and should be um, out and done within the next couple months. Along with that, we're doing a Kickstarter in April, which will further the promotion along with giving us additional funding to start our company. Um, we have a goal in May to do a college campus tour. Lipscomb University gets out significantly earlier than a lot of universities across the West. And so our goal is to go physically into those universities, showing off our product, telling people about the mission of Ed, and making them feel like they're part of the family before they even start purchasing from us. Along with that, our goal further down the road, um, and end goal is to get a celebrity to endorse us and make um, become part of the Ed family, furthering our publicity even more. In the United States, there are currently 72 uh, backpack companies or companies that sell some type of backpack. And of those, only three have any type of uh, like donation built into their business model. So really, we only have three competitors. And of those three, uh, none of them do anything with female education, and none of them even have the same target market as us. Uh, so we are going to sell our backpacks online. And th there's a $10 discrepancy. It's for a marketing strategy. But uh, we will be selling the backpacks for $75. The cost of material uh, is about $11 plus uh, uh, manufacturing. That's another $11. So it comes out to be $22. And then there's our gross profit per product of $53. And then from there, that's where we take our donation of 20%, uh, which leaves us with a margin per unit of $42. Uh, our startup costs are a little over $30,000, and that includes basic inventory of 400 backpacks, uh, basic marketing uh, for a video, and some legal fees. And essentially, all we have to do is sell 400 backpacks to break even, because we don't have very many fixed assets or anything like that. Um, and our goal is by the end of the year to sell 2,500 uh, backpacks. That sounds like a big number, but when you think in the grand scale of 50.1 million college students, there's 100,000 college students just in Middle Tennessee, it's very attainable and realistic within our first year. And if we hit that, we'll have a gross profit of $106,000. So currently, we are in the second phase of our ready to launch. We are an official LLC in the state of Tennessee. Uh, our website is currently being created. Our prototype is being made by a professional designer, and everything's going according to schedule. Uh, we will be hitting phase three by the end of January, early February. That's where we'll be looking for a larger investor to help with our Kickstarter fund. Um, and then we will officially launch the business in April of 2016. That will include our uh, Kickstarter video and also our website. And the reason that we really believe this is all possible is because of the team we have. Uh, I really believe that we have a very unique group of individuals that are very passionate and driven and energetic people uh, that all come from very different backgrounds, though. Uh, all different majors, uh, three different states. But we've all been able to come together and unify under uh, what Ed stands for. And we also have a graphic designer who's helping with our logo. We have a web designer making our website. And we have a professional designer, like I mentioned, who's making our backpack. But all this to say, uh, I think the team is the main reason that uh, Edpac Global will be the premier brand associated with female education in the upcoming years. Once again, the Ed family aspires to equip and empower women worldwide. And we are Edpac Global. So how, how are you going to get people to know about this? How are you going to, what, how's your? Um, how are we going to get consumers to be aware of Ed? Um, well, in large, it's going to be on social media, with that being a huge outlet for uh, students today. So that's going to be a big form of our advertising. Uh, along with that, word of mouth is going to be big, um, because like we were talking about earlier, college students are always trying to find uh, a way to feel like they're socially making a difference, and they are making a difference in the world. and so. Um, whenever they start hearing about this company that's doing that, that's a big thing. Like Tom's, for example, whenever everyone figured out that they were making a difference in the world, just word of mouth blew up the company instantly. Uh -huh. How much money have you spent on this so far? Who's spending the money? Who's so, so far, our costs have actually been pretty minimal. Uh, because Who's, our, whose money is it? It's my money and our money. So it's all out of our own pockets. Uh, we're still doing uh, some basic debt financing. Are you the CEO? I am. Uh, so we are an official LLC, so basic legal costs, uh, basic costs for our first prototype and getting all the materials together for that. But overall, our costs have been very minimal. How much? Um, under $600 right now. So 
what was the thirty thousand on there? Is that what you want to raise? Thirty thousand dollars is what we hope to have uh, raised to cover our video because that's the one thing we're really going for is Kickstarter campaigns can just take off. It's an amazing what it can do. But to have a good Kickstarter, you need to have, need to have a very professional video. And those aren't cheap. So we're looking to have uh, put a lot of money into marketing, essentially, so people know about our brand. But then we're also putting a lot of money into research and development um, and then inventory uh, for the backpacks. That's where the 30000 comes in. Talk to me more about your college tour as part of your marketing plan. I don't know how many backpacks a student goes through in four years. Mm -hmm. Does a person buy one every year? <clears throat> Not necessarily, but consistently since um, I've only done research for the past couple of years, but consistently since 2010, over 100 million backpacks are being sold a year. And so with our number being 25,000, um, that's 0.0017% of the market. Um, and so our goal is not necessarily to go to these colleges and just have tons of students buy it, but for um, whenever we take this college tour and we're going to multi different, a bunch of different campuses, um, just the brand awareness that we'll create is our goal to start peppering Ed into each campus and goals that over the upcoming years it will become more popular. How do most people buy backpacks now? Most, most backpacks are purchased online. Yeah. And so um, with that, we're going to sell exclusively from the website at least to start because that's how most backpacks are bought anyway. Um, especially whenever they're lifestyle backpacks. Whenever you get into like outdoor backpacking backpacks, those are bought in stores because you have to get fitted. But all lifestyle backpacks are mostly bought online currently. How many backpacks like that do you see here? How many, how many lifestyle backpacks? Lifestyle backpacks? Oh, it's a vast majority. La yeah, lifestyle yeah. backpacks are almost all backpacks that you'll see on a campus. Yeah. I mean, so you see a bunch of them here? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. lots, lots, and lots of them. Uh, some right. popular brands are stuff like Herschel, uh, but more of the sport brands we kind of stay away from those. But lots and lots of people have them. Here. So your competition then? Who's your competition? Uh, we have three uh, direct competitors, and they're Cotopaxi, uh, which is more of an outdoorsy uh, backpack company. So it's like you buy something and then you give towards like funding nature kind of stuff. And then another one is Stone and Cloth. Their backpacks are one hundred seventy-five dollars a piece, and they give ten hours of education. So that's the closest thing, but they are extremely overpriced. Uh, in comparison to what we're doing. And well, how then, much are they? How much are 170? Our backpacks or their backpacks? How much is the first backpack you were telling me? The first backpack, they're around uh, 90 to $100. And how much is the second one you were telling me about just then? $175. And yours is how much? 75 How much does it cost to make? $22. Who wears it make being made? So, uh, that so that's what we're currently figuring out um, well, right now. Minute. So we, we, we can't say we know it's 22 bucks when you don't know where it's Well, I've done work. research. Yeah. Um, and so I've done research and I've been in contact with other companies producing backpacks. Um, and we're currently looking at either outsourcing to another country or build, just building them here. But if manufacturing is in the US, it's going to increase the cost. And so that's what a lot of our research is going to right now is figuring out where we can get these produced um, with still having like being labor conscious because we don't want our product being produced in a sweatshop if our whole goal is to um, well, say, better say somebody said, okay, I'll take a thousand of them. Then what would you do? Who would who'd make the first move in that of you guys? I want a thousand of them. So what happens? So the order would be made on our website, and it would be actually gone to our third-party warehouse. We're going to have a third-party warehouse, and then they would be the ones who actually uh, take the order and then ship out the So you, you, you couldn't do it right now? Right now? No, yeah. okay. we couldn't. But we're working on uh, the prototype that's being created. Uh, that was actually the picture we made it in a 3D model, so it's like we can send it to designers and stuff like that. Okay. Um, yeah. So currently, the first prototypes under design or under production, um, and we're <laughs> just getting that um, sewn by a professional seamstress locally. Um, and then once she does that, we're going to take it. We're going to make modifications just to ensure that the product is quality. Um, and then after that, we're going to start getting in contact with manufacturers. Um, but manufacturing research that I've done has put our estimates right about 22 to 25 dollars. Yeah, uh, I've done one before previously for a music project. Um, so I have done some Kickstarter. We haven't figured out our full marketing plan for yeah. it yet. Um, but since we do have until April, um, that's kind of like our next step. We wanted to make sure we had a legitimate product before we tried advertising it through a Kickstarter. So when this thing peaks, how much you th what, what's your goal to be, to be, what's your goal in the whole thing? So the goal is to create an infrastructure where we can take as many bags as possible because once you set it up, it can just grow exponentially depending on how the market reacts to it. So uh, right now, our estimates are around 2,500, but based on one of the projects we have to do, we made a three-year forecast, and with a 25% growth every year, it's, it's looking pretty good. We could have over $300 uh, in revenue 
uh, within three years. 300,000. 300,000, sorry, what did I say? <laughs> 300. 300, just 300. So, <laughs> and you're, so are you planning to like, this is a business for y'all to, to, to do and make a living and do all that stuff with? Potentially. Yes, sir. So in, that's 100,000 bucks a year, y'all are gonna split every year 100,000 bucks? Well, that's actually after uh, basic. That's after? Basic uh, salaries. Basic salaries. I mean, we're not paying ourselves very much right now. Though. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. Right. You're only looking to raise 30,000 in the beginning? Or what's your target for, you know, round A? Uh, well, right now, that is what we're looking for because it's a modest estimate. Uh, but depending on how, Again, the market responds to the bags. We could uh, be asking for more money, but right now, uh, just getting cash flow going, that's really what we need to get going, is $30,000. But you're not sure about the $30,000? No, the estimates are actually around like 28, but 30,000 just a little bit for legal fees and stuff like that. Okay, it's okay. Uh, but yeah, 30,000. Sure. It's 400 backpacks, $15,000 <laughs> for the marketing campaign, and we should be really solid. Well, thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, folks, welcome. These folks are using. I think we're about ready to uh, announce uh, the winners for this round. I, I did want to acknowledge a couple of people that were in here. Uh, one uh, is one of our winners from last year, and I'm sure you have uh, shown them your desk to everybody. It would stand still, right? But. <laughs> But he actually, uh, he actually used his winnings to build a prototype, and so Michael can show you that. And it's really pretty cool. It works, which was amazing. Oh, I mean, it worked. That, that was good. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that was good. Yes, I, I know. So that's good. It rises. Yes, it does. And it didn't fall down when you put weight on it either. So that's good. Uh, and so I, so I just, uh, you know, you might want to uh, talk with him about uh, what goes on uh, after you win and how you continue to develop a business. I personally want to thank the judges again, uh, Betsy, Scott, David, thank you all. They uh, deliberated quite a bit upstairs, and we also have, uh, I have some notes as well that we'll talk about, and they'll be glad to talk with you afterward uh, as well. And, and yes, oh, and then, uh, and then the other thing is I want to thank uh, my good friend, uh, Miguel Cortez, who has uh, put all of this on. Uh, with a, uh, uh, with a great smile while he does it. The fact that he can work for Jerry and me and still smile is a pretty amazing thing. But then he also has a job when he gets out. So that's, uh, you know, that makes him smile pretty well anyway. So uh, the, uh, the third place uh, winner for tonight and $1,000 is Ed Pat Global. So, here we go, guys. Yeah, congratulations, uh, congratulations, congratulations. <laughs> Does the fourth member want to join or no? <laughs> she left. <laughs> yeah, let's see. And then the uh, second place winner uh, with $1,500, Fitness by Verse. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. And I, we want you to come get pi pictures with Jerry here as well. And then the uh, first place winner, and by the way, all three of these have uh, opportunities that are automatically finalist in the April finals as well for the $10,000 prize. And Jerry will be talking with you about how to continue to move forward. Uh, and the uh, first place winner for $2,500, Sweet Bites. Congratulations. Congratulations. So we'll take, let Miguel get a picture. All right. Now, for those of you that uh, for one by, that, that did not uh, get one of the prizes, we do have uh, some things we can talk about as far as uh, helping. And I would encourage you, uh, it was actually a very close competition so I would encourage you to talk with uh, Jerry or me about that uh, and be ready to pitch in the preliminary round in April. So it gives you some time to get ready to do that. Uh, and with that, Jerry, it's There's all yours. A, one, of the thing, one of the prize I'm going to give to the three winners tonight, and that's going to be a, a uh, free opportunity to, free to you, the winners, an opportunity to work with Scott Rouse at the Nashville Entrepreneur Center as a mentor for the next six months. 
And so Scott will help you uh, help you uh, hone those pitches in pretty tight. He uh, and he is the pitch master in town. What else you got? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Other than I do want to say, you know, I've worked. I was very close. One of the reasons I didn't go to the room with the judges is that we've had mock competitions, uh, and I've gotten very close to all of you, and so I've really enjoyed working with you. And I was not going to go up there and uh, go through that. Yeah, but he did give me the list of the I quotes. He did not. <laughs> yeah, I did not. No, he did not go up there. I will there. encourage you, though, we have a lot of resources at Lipscomb. Uh, you guys, many of you guys are going through Joe's class in the spring uh, that will take you further to launch. And so spend, spend some time working with us in the mock competitions, uh, even if you have to set them up at times when we're not doing them for, you know, multiple presentations, okay? Just call me yeah. and we'll set one up for you, okay? Okay. Y'all have a good evening. Have a good break, too. Thank you. And Marty, thanks again. We appreciate it.